All right, so this is our first presentation on Chapter 17, Electrochemistry. So some key points for Chapter 17 for Test 4, galvanic voltaic cells, shorthand for how to write them out, cell potentials and free energy changes for the reactions, looking at standard reduction potentials, the electrochemical determination of pH, and more with rela relationship between uh, cell potential and equilibrium constants, a little bit on batteries, fuel cells, and corrosion, and then finally ending off with electrolysis and the electrochemical cell, or yeah, yeah, and electrolytic cells. Things we won't focus on for test four, commercial applications of electrolysis and the section, why are some metal objects brightly colored? These kind of go into some more applica applications that are just not as, of, uh, not as much of interest to us. So let's take a look at some of these key terms. Now there are a lot here, <laughs> so we're gonna walk through them kind of step by step, but I wanna just make sure we have a good, solid understanding before we get into this chapter. So electrochemistry is the area of chemistry concerned with the interconversion of chemical and electrical energy. Electrochemical cells are an electrochemical setup using a redox reaction, which as we define below is a reaction in which electrons are transferred from one species, which is called oxidized, to another that's called reduced. This is Chem 151 kind of level review material. And again, you can go back to the Chem 151 materials for review um, if you have any questions about that. Um, going back up, so we'll separate this redox reaction into these things called half cells, which are contained in two separate spots, like two separate containers or two little blocks in a, in a battery setup or something like that. And we connect them with a wire and a salt bridge. And this basically forces the electrons to flow through the wire in order to connect the two chemical processes together. And the salt bridge keeps each side from accumulating too much charge. And electrochemical cells fall into one of two categories, either galvanic or voltaic, which are spontaneous. They call them different texts in different places. We'll call them galvanic or voltaic and electrolytic cells, which are non-spontaneous and require outside electrical energy to run, like they need to be plugged in a wall. Those are like recharging your, a battery is the electrolytic cell, and when the battery discharges, that's the galvanic or voltaic cell. Um, so oxidation is the loss of electrons from some species. The electrons are removed from some species. We say oxidation is loss of electrons. It's related to like what oxygen does to something. That's where the name comes from. Oxygen generally takes electrons away from metals or fuels. It be the oxygen becomes negatively charged and the metal becomes positively charged and that forms some ionic compound like when something's rusting. So that's where the term oxidation comes from. It was all named before they knew, they knew what electrons were. A lot of this stuff in electricity and electrochemistry came about before the discovery of the electron. So the terminology is still very much based on like processes instead of on like what electrons do to something. Reduction, right, is the process of adding electrons to a species. So reduction is gain. We can imagine that as a positive charge decreases, becomes less positive is a reduction. Um, and that's where we can think about things reducing, becoming closer to neutral or becoming more negative, um, and that's your reduction. Again, these were named before the electron was discovered. So electrodes are, are plates, typically metals used inside an electrochemical cell to conduct electricity. Sometimes they're chemically active, sometimes they're not. It depends, we'll see more about that. A salt bridge, like I said, is a connection that provides ions to balance out charges as electrons move from one half cell to another. So as negative charge moves from one side to another, we'll need to have ions move into the into the cells in order to keep the cells from accumulating charge. And that's where the names anode and cathode come from. The anode is the side that anions move to. It's the side where oxidation takes place. So an, ox, red, cat. The reduction takes place at the cathode where they're gained, where they come into the system. So anions move toward the anode from the salt bridge in order to balance out the charge from lost electrons, which are negatively charged and thus the name. And in a cathode, uh, cations move toward the cathode from the salt bridge to balance out charge gained from gained electrons, which are negatively charged. So this is where those names ultimately, ultimately come from, and the charge on these kind of depends on which way you're looking at it, and we'll talk a little more about that later. But again, our, our current from the standpoint of electrochemical cells and as chemists flows from the negative side, the side that has that loses you know, electrons, it's usually labeled as, as negative, the source of the electrons, to a positive side, which ends up gaining those electrons. And 
that's the reverse of the typical conventional current where current flows from positive to negative and the positive side's hot and the earth is the negative side. It really doesn't matter from the standpoint of the electricity. Like it just matters from the standpoint of like naming and convention and, and understanding in different contexts, right? Um, but in an electrochemical cell, we'll typically use the, the electric cell notation, but we'll, we'll see as, um, as we go through where conventional current may also come up again and may actually elucidate things a little bit more in the terminology. So there's also this electromotive force, right? Like we can say that when we measure a voltage, right, an electrical potential, it's kind of like a, like, a, like a height difference sort of thing. It's a, it's a difference between two points that draws electrons or charged particles from one side to another, right? And we say there's some fictitious force that is said to do this. This isn't really how it works, but it's a, it's a thought, right? We say the voltage measures this electromotive force that's kind of like an electrical pressure that pushes things in one side or to one side or another, depending on how the voltage is defined, right? And we talked a little bit about how conventional current flows from positive to negative, and this convention was established before the discovery of the electron in 1897. So this just kind of stuck with it, even though it's not truly how things actually work, and that results in a lot of confusion. So I like to make a note about that. The Faraday is the electric charge on one mole of electrons, 96,485 coulombs per mole. We'll use that as a conversion factor in a few places. The standard reduction potential is the potential for the reduction of a half cell under standard state. It's like with that little degree sign like we've talked about in previous chapters, defined as one molar concentration, one atmosphere pressures, solids and liquids in pure forms, and at 25 degrees Celsius. The standard hydrogen electrode, also sometimes called SHE, S-H-E, um, is the reference for half cells so that we can establish a zero point for voltage. We'll see what that means in a little more detail later, but there's a reference electrode that gains, uh, has hydrogen ions gain two electrons to form hydrogen gas under standard conditions. So like one molar and one atmosphere and inert electrode, there's a whole thing. But we, and again, we'll delve into this in more detail in a bit. And again, a little more about these fuel cells. They're galvanic cells in which one of the reactants is a a fuel or a, something that could in theory be combusted, but we're not actually using it as a combustion. We're doing it as a solely electrical reaction as a fuel cell. Corrosion is oxidative destruction of a metal. So usually with oxygen gas, re metal reacts slowly with oxygen gas to form rust. And electrolysis is the process of using an external electric current to bring about a chemical change. And again, we'll see that uh, close to the end of this chapter. So first, let's take a look here at galvanic or voltaic cells, right? So if we think about a redox reaction, again, this is 151 review material type of thing, we can think about there there's being an oxidative reaction, the one that loses the electrons, and a reduction half reaction, the one that gains the electrons. These free electrons are never, strictly speaking, seen. They'd be canceled out from a chemical standpoint, but this exchange of charge between species is what establishes this as a redox reaction, right? Remember this agent terminology too, that the thing that is reduced is often called the oxidizing agent, and the thing that is oxidized is often called the reducing agent. These, reducing, these agent terminologies are reversed from the standard. You should know and be aware of this. It comes up a lot in tests and in, on standardized exams and questions. They assume you'll know all this terminology and not get it all confused. And it can actually be a very confusing, so I want to make sure that you make a note of this for yourself right now um, as we move through this material because this text will use this terminology too. So they submerge a strip of zinc metal into an aqueous copper sulfate solution. A redox reaction occurs in which electrons from the outer layer of the zinc metal um, give electrons to the copper in the solution. The copper falls down and the zinc is removed and the zinc ends up plated in copper ends up this dark color, which is actually copper accumulating on the surface of the zinc. This is a standard redox reaction, and thus we could produce galvanic and voltaic cells out of this by separating these two reactions into two separate steps and connecting them with wires. This process is often referred to as a Daniel cell, which is what they describe here, a beaker with strips and things connected. This is like the simplest kind of electrochemical cell or the simplest kind of battery. That's really what these are. Batteries are just a, a series of electrochemical cells. There's like a, they, the word battery in that sense means like a, like a, it comes from like a battery of soldiers, like having a group of things. Like this sense of battery is a group of cells. Like they group a bunch of cells together into a compact space. And that's what a battery is. Um, so batteries are just an assemblage of galvanic or voltaic cells into a group. 
And we can build these half cells in order to be able to observe all the little pieces, but understand that like when we, they build compactified batteries, they work by the same principle. They're just shrunk. They don't take up several beakers on a table. They fit in the palm of your hand instead. But the basic science that, and, and physics that makes them operate is the same. So they talk about strips of zinc and copper electrodes connected by a salt bridge and an inert electrode, right? This is similar to, uh, to like the reaction between zinc and copper metals where zinc gives electrons to copper is also the basic principle behind a potato battery. When you have like a potato and they put those electrodes in it, like if you've ever done that before, that, that's another kind of electrochemical cell and the potato is the salt bridge and the two electrodes react with each other over that period. Um, it turns out you can also just get two metals to directly react with each other. It's a little more detailed than where we are at this point, but um, this basic principle of something giving electrons to something else in a redox reaction and having cells and measuring a voltage over distance is all is all the same regardless of how it's done, right? So let's look at the components of this uh, of this Daniel cell, right? And we notice that redox reactions can be done all in one solution, but in order to get electricity to flow through something, we need to have some, some sort of barrier. We need to have some kind of establishment of different areas so that electrical flow occurs through some conductor that then I can put my little light bulb or something in, right? So we have this copper which is the cathode, right? It's submerged in some solution of copper sulfate. The bridge is some sodium sulfate here. And sodium ions will move here, cations move to the cathode. They don't, they show this kind of in reverse here, anions moving up and that can happen too. But in general, we need to have some kind of compensation for the negative charge that's coming into this side. As negative charge comes into this side, we have to compensate for it with loss of negative ions or increase in positive ions, something like that. Because as this charge comes in, these positive ions are being consumed and attached to this electrode. And over here, on the opposite side, on the anode side, electrons are leaving. So the zinc anode is deteriorating, the metal is turning into ions, and electrons are moving across this wire. And so negative ions need to come out here to compensate for this loss of negative charge across the wire. Again, this was observed by 19th century people, and that's where the names all came in for the different sides and the different terminals, right? Generally, we'll call this cathode positive and this anode negative, but that terminology is, is related to the direction of the flow, right? Because the anode is where the electrons start from and the, elect the electrons are drawn to the positive side. We say things, the electrons, since they're negatively charged, move from negative to positive. And so once we hook, if we hook this up correctly and we put the positive to the positive side and the negative to the negative side, we'll get a voltage. Since voltages are generally measured conventionally, they assume that something flows from the red positive to the black negative. That's how they're connected, even though really it flows the other way around in this cell. It doesn't really matter. They've got a little salt bridge with these disks and you can measure a voltage. A positive voltage, when this is connected correctly to positive, to red and negative to black is indicates that the cell is galvanic and flows spontaneously. If it measures a negative voltage, it just means it's hooked up backwards. You can't measure a negative voltage for a cell that doesn't work unless you apply a voltage to it because there won't be one. So a backward cell doesn't measure backward on the meter. It measures nothing because there's no flow at all. If it, if it was negative here, that would just mean you've connected the terminals backward. These are just notes about how like a voltmeter works in case there's something you're not aware of. Um, again, the anode at which the electrode at which oxidation occurs is the anode, and the one at which reduction occurs is the cathode. And this breaks apart the basic reactions, and we talk about the salt bridge. Anodes move toward the anion, cations move toward the cathode. Keeps that simple. Now, when they talk about labeling the signs, the electrodes of commercial galvanic cells are typically labeled plus and minus. And, and it's not about the charge that's actually at the spot, it's from the perspective of the wire. And we say in, a, in an electrochemical cell, electrons will flow from the negative to the positive. Again, there's other ways that you can accumulate electric charge. And so sometimes only one of these will be what they call it hot, meaning that one of them is an earth, like with the plugs in a wall in a typical home. The positive side is connected to the power plant and is pulled positive by the power plant's activities. And the negative side is like an earth. But that may or may not be the case in every wiring and in every system, so don't, don't quote me on that. But like 
it can be different depending on how the labeling is, but in an electrochemical cell, you always have to have both, and it's the potential between them that's measured, and the negative sign indicates the side of where the electrons come from, and the positive side indicates where they go to. Um, and from the perspective of the wire, the anode looks negative because a stream of negatively charged electrons comes from it. From the perspective of the solution, however, the anode looks positive because a stream of positively charged uh, Zn2 plus ions flows from it. There's like, again, it depends on the perspective and where you look at it, but generally we're going to call our, our, an our anion, an anode negative and our cathode positive to keep with convention. And they show us a labeled battery here. A battery like this, like the Zavaretti lantern battery, is an electrochemical cell. So it follows all the same principles as all our other electrochemical cells, no matter how many different ones are in here and um, how they're connected in series or how they're set up. It doesn't really matter. We can treat it like it's one big cell. And the anode is where the oxidation occurs, where the electrons are produced, where anions migrate to, and we label that as negative, where reduction occurs, where electrons are consumed, where cations migrate to, and we label that as having a positive sign. Again, they say, why do anions move to the anode? Again, it's to, it's to balance out the charges that are leaving, right? So as negative charge leaves, positive charge falls off, and negative charge has to come with it. They say the anode's negative charge is shielded from surrounding zinc ions, which enter the solution from the surface. And you can say that the zinc ions pull the negative ions in. But in general, the creation of the zinc ions is a result of the electrons leaving. So like, there's kind of different ways to, uh, different ways to look at it here. And again, we look back at the uh, we look back at this reaction as well. They say the cathode hat reaction is multiplied by two to make this balance out so that the electrons can cancel. Remembering that this doesn't affect the voltage, and we'll we'll see that later. But it does affect the the current transfer. The number of electrons transferred is important in determining how much energy a particular cell can obtain and various other things. But ultimately, it De it depends on how the cell is balanced and, and ultimately the choice of the, the two reactions determines the overall voltage and we'll see that a little bit later. Again, we see another nice picture of a voltaic cell. You should be able to label the different parts of the cell. Draw yourself a very basic cell for a reaction in your notes and get a sense of doing this. I, I won't require you to do a drawing like this on an exam though, but be aware that you may have to label parts of a cell and understand how the cell works. And you know, if we're if if you were in a seated class where we were going to do labs, we build our own cell, so you'd get to see one actually work. So designing a galvanic cell. So they say we want to use this redox reaction here, right? So the first question is uh, what's oxidized and what's reduced here. So it looks like the chromium is oxidized because it loses electrons, and the tin is reduced because it gains electrons. So we can label the half cells as such. The chromium loses three electrons and the tin, gain, uh, the tin gains two for each one. But it's balanced already, so if it wasn't balanced, we'd have to balance it because the number of electrons lost has to equal the number of electrons gained. Some, some redox reactions will have multiple oxidations and multiple reductions, but still everything has to sum up and we have to get rid of the electrons. And there always must be at least one oxidation and one reduction for every um, redox reaction ever shown. So they show any inner electrode can be used. Uh, they talk about wire moving from the anodes from one to the other. So let's take a look here at the shorthand notation that's commonly used for galvanic cells. So the way these are written, and they've got a diagram down here, at the bottom, they show that the anode half cell reaction is written first with two lines, and then the cathode half cell reaction. And they use phase boundaries here, and they typically write these in reverse, so that the aqueous is closest to the double line, and then solids are on the outside, and then they'll put gases uh, further out. They'll keep putting more lines if there are more phase boundaries. But the double line indicates the salt bridge, and this tells you anode is on the left and the cathode is on the right. This is a notation that sometimes they'll give you in a problem, and you'll have to decode it in order to understand what's going on. So this is your little decoder ring down here at the bottom to understand how this notation works. Um, this same reaction is written up here, is written down here. So if you reverse which one's written on which side, it can change from a galvanic or voltaic to an electrolytic cell, depending on which one you state needs to be the anode, which is oxidized, and which one you state to be the cathode, which is reduced. And again, they have additional vertical lines if there's more phases for the different 
uh, for the different electrodes or for other stuff that's going on or how this is used. And they also put gas pressures in here as well and put the gas on the in inside in some contexts, depending on, see the gas is part of this reaction process. Typically they write the electrodes furthest out. Um, but yeah, if you just have a cell drawing, you'll have to label everything. That's what they also note here. The anode half cell always appears in the left and the shorthand. Its location in the cell drawing is arbitrary. So which side it's on depends. You'd have to label it. Like I said, a good diagram, a good picture of a cell would have to have everything labeled. So they want us to use this shorthand notation here. So they're looking at um, this platinum electrode, SN2 plus to 4 plus, and this is on the left side, so that's the anode, that's the oxidation. Oxidation is lost, so SN2 plus has to go to SN4 plus and two, electro and two electrons. Platinum electrode is inert, so we can ignore that. The cathode reduction half reaction is something that gains, so it goes from the 2 plus to the solid. Again, that's typically why they write it in that order over here too, to help you, to help you see. We'll have to multiply this silver reaction by 2 to balance out and cancel the electrons. And then we can combine these together and get an overall cell reaction and a brief description of the cell. So there'll be some platinum elect, uh, anode dipped into this solution. And then uh, they say a silver cathode. And they must be connected by a wire and a salt bridge containing inert ions. Usually your salt bridge, you don't want that to be anything that interferes with your reaction. So you'll pick inert stuff like sodium nitrate or sodium chloride or something like that. Um, your choice can also depend on how high the voltage is in your cell because um, certain ions can react under certain conditions. So that's something else to keep in mind with your choice of salt. So now here they talk about cell potentials and free energy change. We get a little bit into this idea of a cell voltage, right? A voltage, right, is kind of like an electrochemical pressure and they measure this potential of some EMF, which is again like a fake force. We talked a little bit about that later. They write the cell potential as E, which is a little confusing because sometimes you might think that's energy, but that's just the common terminology. They just write it as E, not like a delta E, not like any other, just an E. And that's voltage. You'd think they'd write V, but no, they write E. Um, C is an amount of charge in coulombs, and you can use this to calculate watts, which is power joules per second, based on amps current times voltage in volts. Um, and if you take voltage times coulombs, how much charge is moved at what pressure, you'll get how much energy that is. They talk here about like one watt is one joule per second, and that we typically operate in like tens and hundreds of watts, like a light bulb at 15 or 30 or 75 watts, and household voltage of 110 volts is about 0.7 amps, meaning that the electric charge of the electrons passing through is 0.7 coulombs. And we can convert coulombs to moles of electrons with the Faraday constant, and we'll see that in a little bit. So the Faraday constant, 96,500, uh, it's usually 485, they round that for these calculations. But depending on how many sig figs you need, you can, you can take this out further. Um, and they also give us a relationship here with delta G, the free energy change, right? Where N here is the number of electrons transferred, F's the Faraday constant, and E is the voltage um, for this cell. And again, we're going to assume that this is a galvanic cell, so E will be positive, and that will mean that this whole thing will be negative because the number of moles can't be a negative number. Faraday constant's not negative. So as long as the voltage is a positive number, like it's a real you know, galvanic cell, then delta G will be a negative number, and that makes sense because only spontaneous reactions can generate a voltage. A non-spontaneous reaction would, in that sense, consume a voltage. You would have to power a voltage in order to make that happen. If you just leave the cell sitting there, it won't generate like a negative voltage. I can't measure that. It would have to be hooked up, and this would be the voltage it would take to make it run, and that's the, that would be the opposite voltage. So we've also got this standard cell potential, right? And that's just the cell potential measured in the standard state. It's more important here, but solutes are at one molar concentration. The pressure is one atmosphere. The temperature is 25, typically. Same like all other standard states with these little degree sign circles, not signs, as we've seen them before. So delta G naught here is equal to negative F E naught. So we can look up standard cell potentials and get standard delta Gs and vice versa as long as we have the number of electrons transferred in the Faraday constant, 
we're able to interconvert between delta G and a voltage without any problem. So as long as there's a positive voltage, then delta G will be a negative number and the system will be spontaneous. Any galvanic cell producing a voltage must inherently be spontaneous. So they want us to calculate the free energy change if the voltage is 0.9. Sometimes they'll write a positive sign in front of positive voltages too, just to indicate, because sometimes it can be confusing. So they show down here we plug in that six moles of electrons are transferred. That's just the, once we balance the equation, how many electrons have to cancel out when we combine the two half cell reactions together, that's what that N number is. The Faraday constant, 0.9 volts, and then we'll see that all our units cancel out and we end up with a number in joules, which we can convert to kilojoules, and it's negative as we expect. So for a spontaneous reaction. Standard reduction potential. So typically the way that reference materials work to calculate the value for an overall cell is that they give me the standard reduction potentials for reactions as reductions and then I'll reverse one and add that to it and then I'll get the standard cell potential. Um, typically they're written as reductions in reference materials. Um, and that reference voltage is to a standard hydrogen electrode, Xi, which we talked about a little bit earlier. So it, it's difficult, though, because I can't measure the voltage of a single, of a half part of a reaction. The voltage only flows when the circuit is complete. So the only way I can do this is to have some reference zero, so then I can base everything else off that, which is kind of what was done, right? This is this Xi electrode. It's got hydrogen gas in it platinum, hydrogen gas, and hydrogen ions in here. We'll see that there's some interesting uh, results from the choice of hydrogen as the standard reference. One molar, one atmosphere, all of those are standard conditions. So then we can attribute all of the voltage to this reduction, the gain of these two electrons at the copper cathode. So we can say that that reaction is plus 0.34 volts because we're going to assume that this reaction is zero. So again, we'll see that this, uh, we'll be able to combine these two together. We can also reverse reactions in order to get a, the opposite sign voltage. We'll see how this goes in a little more. But it's similar to the standard enthalpies of formation, delta F, as we're calculating these. Just keeping in mind that unlike delta H, um, if we have multiple moles of the chemical system, we don't get to increase the voltage. The voltage is only dependent on our choice of cell components. So unlike enthalpy, where you know if we do two moles of it, we get to multiply this formation energy by two, that's not true for, for E cell, for voltages. So again, here, both directions of our standard electrode have, are at zero volts. But this shows how we were able to get a voltage for the reduction, the gain of electrons by copper two plus ions to form copper metal to get 0.34 volts. And that's our standard reduction potential for this reaction this half part and then we'll get to see eventually that so if we reverse it we get the opposite sign if we reverse a half cell we get the opposite sign but if we multiply it by two we don't get to multiply this by two and again they show the same process measuring against the zinc one where they get 0.76 um, measured against this electrode here as well so and again this is the um, this is the oxidation, though, so this will have to be defined negatively because this side's getting oxidized and this side's getting reduced. So this will be a negative 0.76. So we'll see that on this chart, right? So this reaction we were just looking at with the zinc is a negative 0.76. And this copper reaction was a positive 3.34 when it's a reduction. So what's interesting about this chart is that things that are really electronegative their gain of electrons tends to produce a really positive E cell voltage for the reduction. And conversely, things that tend to lose electrons tend to be very negative um, and when they're run backward. Right? So we can imagine we would generally be reversing these really high ones down here. Because each redox reaction has to have one side be reduced and one side be oxidized. So we can pick one that's reduced like off this chart and then pick another one and reverse it. And then the sum of those two E cell voltages needs to be positive in order to build a galvanic cell out of it. Also keep in mind that because we chose hydrogen like this, generally speaking, the metals below hydrogen, okay, 
they will tend to run backward with hydrogen. So they will tend to be, another way to state that is they tend to dissolve um, in acids really well, and those above tend to be more resistant to acidic corrosion, like silver and copper. So that's another note that you can make by looking at this chart based on the choice here of hydrogen as our reference. Keep in mind another couple of key points. The half reactions are written as reductions, right, rather than oxidations. The listed half slope potentials are standards, so they're at the standard states. And the half reactions are generally listed in decreasing potential, so they go from positive to negative. Um, and we generally get standard reduction potentials from about plus 3 volts to minus 3 volts due to our choice of uh, conditions and our choice of the standard hydrogen electrode as a reference. Strongest oxidizing agents are things that are most electronegative, tend to be at the top of the table, are things that tend to be um, oxidized, okay, tend to be reducing agents, tend to be at the bottom of the table, like things like lithium and sodium and stuff like that, and at the top we see things like fluorine. Um, the ordering of half cells also corresponds to the ordering of the activity series of metals. More active metals um, are toward the bottom and have negative reduction potentials, and less active metals tend to be above hydrogen. Again, another way to say a metal is less active is to say that it's less, it's more resistant to corrosion by acid. That's another way of saying the same thing. So you can see how all these different thought processes lead us to a very similar uh, result. So now we're going to look at using these to look at an overall reaction, right? So we're we're looking at this two silver ion with the zinc. So the zinc gives electrons to the silver, and we see that when we look up the oxidation, we have to make it negative from the table value that we look up. We don't get to multiply the reduction potential by two, so it stays the same. There's no multiplication there by two. We add these up and we get a positive voltage, so that means that this can be a spontaneous galvanic cell. Remember, do not multiply the E cell potential by two, um, even though we're multiplying this part by two. In that sense, it does not work like, a, like an enthalpy. So, they talk here a little bit about why E cell values are independent of how much of the reaction takes place. Um, again, the current increases when you have more of the cell, but the, uh, the actual value of the voltage is only dependent on the choice of the reactants. And that makes sense because the value of delta G is, uh, the value of delta G though does depend on the amount, but we're incorporating that by putting an N. So we're, we're making delta G work because we've got this N value in here for the number of moles of electrons transferred. So Again, they talk here a little bit more about how different metals can react with each other, right? Metals that are lower on the chart will give electrons to metals that are higher on the chart because they'll give up electrons more readily. They'll have their reactions reversed. Um, so they say here that... Uh, Silver plus can oxidize reducing agents that lie below, below it on the table, but it can't oxidize bromine, water, and other things because the E cell for those is negative. And that if that if the cell you try to create is negative, then that cell would have to be powered in order to exist, and it's not spontaneous. Again, we look back here at the example. So things higher up on the list here, okay, can stay as reductions. So these down here at the bottom will have to be reversed to to make a positive E cell, generally speaking. Um, so things like, um, you know, uh, uh, something can, they can't, you can't just take one, you have to reverse one of them, right? So generally you won't want to reverse your more, your more positive one, but you might be able to reverse something like this and then couple another one running in the forward direction down here, but you've got to still somehow come up with a way to get, get your voltages to sum up. Because if it doesn't sum up to a positive number after you reverse one of your two, you choose two reactions off this table, you reverse one to make it your oxidation, and then see what your overall cell value is. And only ones that are positive can be spontaneous. So predicting whether the cell is spontaneous, can PB2 plus oxidize aluminum or copper? So it can oxidize copper. Copper will give electrons to it because the E cell voltage for that reaction is positive. You pick the gain of electrons by um, lead, which is the reduction, and then you reverse the one for aluminum and see if that adds up to a positive number. So aluminum is the one getting oxidized. Conversely, if you try to do that with copper, 
you'll get a negative number. So copper cannot be oxidized by the lead ions. In fact, this reaction will run in reverse. These two will swap places, and then that will become a positive number instead. And then that will be the cell that actually runs if you construct it and allow for the reaction to be able to run in reverse. All right, so that will be the end of this first lecture on Chapter 17, Electrochemistry. I hope you found it very useful, and I will see you all in the next one. Thank you.